So basically today, this is kind of a weird view. I don't know why I'm showing it like this, but I really want to be able to see the chat. So for you guys, I'm going to kind of just pull it up like this. Um, so today we're going to cover basically 3D design and 3D printing. A um, couple of the key features that we're going to look at are software considerations, the design fabrication process when it comes to actually printing, uh, tips and tricks for success to get good prints, and a guided exercise to kind of help explain it. Uh, this was actually used, and I don't know if you guys know what AICHE is, but this was a part from Chemicar. Uh, it's clean now. There's no chemicals on it, I promise. But um, So it, they are actually quite useful things. By the way, that is my email. If you have any further questions or anything, just let me know. In hindsight, though, the Teams is going to be weird if I do this, so let's not present it like that. How do I get rid of this? Let's just share the window. Okay. Cool. So, uh, software considerations is a great place to start. So, there are many different options for 3D design software out there. Um, some are free. So, FreeCAD is a great example. Sadly, most of them are not free. And usually, the free ones require quite a bit of coding. So, they're really not good for first time 3D printers. Uh, so one of the more common ones that you tend to see are SolidWorks and Autodesk products. Uh, SolidWorks can do some simulations. Autodesk can also do some simulations. Um, Autodesk also has other options for it, and it has an inversion of Inventor that's specifically for Mac, which is really good because usually both of these softwares really just don't like anything not Windows. Um, so also, if you have something that's not compatible with one of these, there are some options. You can use something called a partition. Uh, you can use a virtual machine or a remote desktop. USF uses a remote desktop. If you're interested in the other options, just talk to me after. I'll explain cool. more about it. What is that? Hello? Okay. Awesome. All right. So uh, USF uses a remote desktop. One thing to keep in mind about remote desktops, by the way, it's not actually your computer. You're just connecting to another computer. That's why if you ever use it, you notice you have to save all your files to a OneDrive and then get it off later. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. Uh, among the common options, you have these two. You have SolidWorks and Inventor, which are most often used. It's probably kind of hard to see, and I really want you to read through all of it, but there are pros and cons to each is basically the takeaway from this. So depending on what you want to do, um, it would be a good idea to look into which software to use. And SolidWorks is what we're going to use, and we're going to do it through USF. Um, you actually already pay for it. You just don't know it. It's lumped into your technology fee. The only thing you need for it is you either download the client for the uh, browser-based version, or you or not the browser-based. You download the actual remote desktop application, or you can do it through a browser. I prefer to download it, but you can do it through either. As long as you're using Chrome or Firefox, I really don't know if Edge works. I kind of hope it doesn't. Um, and I'll show you how to actually find this. It was on the front page here. So if you go to just your regular my USF login under learning and teaching tools. There's something called an application gateway. When you click on it, it'll have you sign in, and then you just open SolidWorks. Oh, thank you. And after that, it just takes a little bit to boot up. Um, it'll honestly take about the same amount of time if you do it in the uh, application version. Um, great. So now you have it. Can you use it? Yes. No. Why? <laughs> Well, there's a very good reason for this. Um, the design fabrication process often has a tendency to look like this. You get a great idea, you draw the idea, you make a 3D design, you print it, yay, and then it doesn't work. Sad face. When it really should look like this, you look at all of your design limitations and requirements, take your idea for the design, and look at the limitations of what your printer can do. And then you get a nice product at the end that you don't have to iterate over like 12 different prototypes, which is always a great thing and it costs less money. 
So a couple tricks, or the, yeah, tricks and tips for success. Um, good old KISS, I'm not going to say what that stands for because apparently it's rude. Um, also, another thing, get the specifics on your printer before you ever do anything. Um, if you have options, plan to use the printer that will give you the worst outcome in case you have to. Uh, the reason for this is sometimes you might want a particular material, that printer may not be able to do it. Maybe only this one can, and this one has a really crappy resolution, which is basically like the smallest level of detail your prints can get. Uh, also, when it comes to 3D prints, if you have anything um, like this, it was printed flat up. You didn't need any supports. If I printed it like this, these little parts in the middle, they're not going to hold themselves up when they print. So you have to print these things called supports. You have to take them out afterwards. And if you're not careful with it, you end up with most of your print being just supports. So also, this kind of goes into the next part. Um, think about how it's going to present or print. You know, think about your print or your supports. Will it tip if it gets too top heavy? Um, you know, what's your infill type that you want to use? And also, is it resin? I mentioned that because resin prints upside down for some reason. I don't know. But anyways, um, also keep in mind the physical end goal requirements. So this is one of the benefits of SolidWorks is you can simulate the mechanical stress and such. Uh, also, if you want it to look pretty, it's an important thing too. Um, two, or last one, is it multi-part? And if so, how do you fit them together? Uh, also, keep in mind your resolution when you're doing that. If you design a tiny little snap-in piece that's exactly the right size and your printer has a slight error, it's not going to fit. So, in short, just try to use these things when you're actually going about making the model before you ever print it, and then the actual printing process will go rather smoothly. So, we're going to do a guided example. You can also pass this one around because I'm... Uh, so we're going to make a housing for a flash drive. Um, I actually ripped that flash drive out of this housing because I thought it looked ugly and I want to make a new one. So we're going to use SolidWorks and we're going to do it through the application gateway. And if we have time, I'm going to see if I can show you how this would go in a, a software that you would use to tell a 3D printer how to work. I use Cura because it's free. There are other ones. I'm sure they're better. Yeah. Uh, also, we're not going to print it because that will take a while. Um, so these are the dimensions that we're going to go with. Um, I'm going to try to keep like this little picture up on the side and reference it every now and again. Uh, this will basically be our guide. Oops. Okay. Now we can get out of that. And I already booted up SolidWorks. So when you actually open it, it's not necessarily going to look like this. Uh, it's going to have another little like pop-up window here. I turned it off because some of the files I have in here are rather sensitive, so I don't want them to flash previews. Um, so we're going to make a new file. You can either come up here to where it says File and New, or you can do the keystroke and Control N. It'll give you some options. You can make a part, you can make an assembly, or you can make a drawing. A part is a single part. An assembly is when you take multiple parts and then you show how they come together. You can make nice animations with it. And a drawing is basically just a technical drawing, usually of a part or an assembly. So in this case, we want to make a part. So click part and then OK. It will take a little bit to load up. And it's still loading. Awesome. OK, so this is what the window is really going to look like. Let me just check to make sure there's no questions. Okay, we're good. This is what the window usually. Well, no. Okay, so this is what the window usually looks like. Um, as you can see, there's really not much in here. These are basically important parts of it. You have your history, whatever sensors are. I never use them. Uh, you can annotate certain pieces. Uh, usually, you're going to annotate things that are called bodies, and we'll get to that. And then you have your starter planes. So these are all of your starting planes. If you want to make a 3D part, you have to start with a 2D sketch. So you want to click this sketch option right here at the top. And then right over here, there's an option for a sketch. Now keep in mind, if you, you can do 3D sketches, um, these can be quite annoying, but they can be useful depending on what you're doing. So we're just going to do a regular sketch. And now you see we get to choose the plane that we want to build it on. I always like to start with the top plane if you're building something from the bottom up. 
if you're trying to build something that comes out of something, you want to use the front plane, so on and so forth. And you can also define your own planes. Uh, we're going to do that later, actually, so you'll see how that works. So now that we selected it, we can actually start drawing things. So if we look back at our, oh, hold on, why are you not, oops, just looking. There we go. And then we bring this up. And whoa. Please don't do that. What is going on? Okay. So now we have our dimensions pulled up here. I'm just going to shrink this so I can see it a little bit better and then zoom in a little bit. It's kind of hard to read. So one of the things that we're going to do is we're going to actually, oh, darn it. So we're going to actually use a method that uh, relies on the combine tool. The reason for this is you can combine solid bodies together or you can actually subtract them from each other. So that's one of the benefits of this is that we're going to design this actual shape of the flash drive chip. And then we're going to create the shape of the housing that we want and we're going to just subtract out the overlap so that there is a gap inside. Um, so we have to first start by actually, what happened here? We have to first start by actually creating the general shape of what this will look like. Um, we're not going to go into super in-depth on this because I don't want to have to draw circuit boards. So it's uh, obviously a rectangle. So we want to start with a rectangle. So we have a couple options here. We have the corner rectangle. You define it based on the two opposing corners. You have a center rectangle, which you click a center point and then you drag out from there. Uh, three point, you choose three of the vertices and so on and so forth. In this case, I want to keep it centered in the middle in this origin, so I'm going to use the center rectangle. Click right here and drag out. And you can drag it to your specific dimensions if you want to. What I would highly recommend you do is after you're done, by the way, when you're using a tool, it'll keep trying to use that tool, just hit escape and it'll get out of it. So first we want to make the, not necessarily the overall dimensions, but we want to make this first little chip that's right over here. So first off, another thing I forgot to mention, and this is kind of a heresy of me, down here is your units. Always keep this in mind because sometimes you may think that you're making a one centimeter wide part when you're actually making a one inch wide part, and that's a very different thing. So I'm going to use millimeters because I measure these in millimeters. Um, so I'm going to change my units to that. So now I want to fit this rectangle here to be the size of this chip. So what I'm going to do, click on this line. You see you have some options. You can also just double click on it and it'll open up the, oh, hold on. Right. There you go. Let me do it. There we go. So I want this line. So you can see here that we actually have the option to define the size of this particular line that we're looking at. We clicked on this line, so it's going to let us resize this line. So if we look over here, we see that it's uh, measured to be 14.5 millimeters. So we're going to... Don't do that. Thank you. So we're going to change it to 14.5. It's already in millimeters, so we don't actually have to add that. Um, one benefit of this, though, is if you add centimeters, it will adjust for that fact. It will convert it for you. Um, don't really want to do that, though. I want to keep it in millimeter. Great, so now it's the right size. Also, um, if you want to zoom in or out, you can just use the scroll wheel. Keep in mind, it's backwards. If you scroll in, you go out. If you scroll out, you go in. So just keep that in mind. Um, so now we're going to change this line to, and this line is supposed to be 33 millimeters. So we'll enter that. And now we have the sideways dimensions of this. We have the rectangle that adds up to essentially what this particular chip would look like. One of the other things that we have to do here, though, is this is just a 2D drawing. This chip actually does have a thickness to it. And if you look here, it's really hard to see it, but it is about one millimeter. Um, 
So we are going to change this to be a three-dimensional block that has one millimeter thickness. So now that we made our 2D sketch, you would come over to this Features tab, and then you have some options here. It's essentially we're going to extrude it. Um, I don't know why they call it a boss space. I just know that extruding means extending it. So you can do it just by the shape. You can actually revolve it around an axis if you want. Or if you have a line, you could create a shape and drag it along that line so you could make like a wire with it. Uh, this is just a regular rectangle, so we're just going to use extrude. Now you see we can change the thickness of it. Is it as whitewashed for you guys as it is for me? Well, so now that we have this, we see we have some options. We have uh, where we're actually extruding it from. So in this case, the sketch plane is essentially the plane that it was sketched on. We sketched it on that top plane. We can also change it if we have like another surface that we want to do it from, a vertex, or we can do an offset if we wanted to extrude it, but we wanted to move it one centimeter up before we extruded it. In this case, that's not really important though. So we're just going to do regular from sketch plane. You can also, this direction part here, you can flip it. It'll go up or down. Uh, there are other options here. You can choose other things. I'm just going to keep it as the basic right now because we don't need any of the advanced stuff. And right here, this is actually where you would select a direction if you wanted to do it in a particular direction. So maybe you wanted it to go at a weird angle and you have a line that's drawn in 3D going that way. You could use that line as your direction. But we're not going to do that here. You also have a second direction. You can get it to go down as well. You can make it thin as it goes. Uh, and this is our selected contour here. Uh, it just doesn't tell you it, but you can select multiple of them. Or I could just do, maybe I only want to do maybe one of these triangles, although it won't let me select it for some reason. But anyway, so let's get rid of that selection. So, we also know that we don't need to go 10 millimeters out. It's only one it's only one millimeter thick according to this diagram, so we only need one millimeter here. So now we have our chip and hit check and yay. So another thing that you can do, you can do this in a couple ways. My favorite way is to basically right click. Hold on. If you double click a body, by the way, and notice how we now have a solid bodies tab. That's this extrude. It basically made a solid, so it's considering that a separate body. If you have other extrusions that aren't attached to each other, they'll be registered as different bodies. Um, so if we double click this, we can select the whole body, and then we can actually add an appearance to it. I'm just going to do this because it makes things easier to register what's going on with them. So we have a lot of options here. Um, Lots of different things. I'm going to go with plastic in this case, simply because it's kind of the closest to what a uh, printed circuit board is made out of, and it's green. So I'm just going to select this pre-selected option, and then go ahead and hit check. And now we have a lovely little green thing, and it won't let me get rid of this window. Go away, please. Thank you. Great. What was it? Yes. It's not actually. No, no, no. This is the whole thing right here, actually. So, yeah, we're just going to keep it relatively basic because all we need this to do is give us the dimensions of how to cut out the, uh, the body of the housing. Okay, so now we have this. Um, also, if you click with the middle mouse button, you can move things around, which is quite lovely. Um, should you end up getting it, you can also use your uh, arrow keys. Um, if you're anything like me, you'll constantly forget how to actually get back to what it is. So if you look at these, you can actually click which one you want to align to. So now I'm aligned with the z-axis, or I could go to the y-axis, and now I'm looking straight down at it. There are other options that you can do for this. Um, forget where they are. Yeah, view orientation. So you can go around different ways. 
to say I wanted to look at it from, I don't know, this direction. I could. Uh, another thing to keep in mind, by the way, when you zoom with the um, scroll wheel, wherever your mouse is is where you zoom. That will throw you off so much, I promise you, so just keep that in mind. So, now that we have that, we have another thing to look at here is that this chip itself is not actually one millimeter thick. Because if you look around this part with the chips on it, the actual microchips that are on it, it makes it more so about 3.5 millimeters thick. So just calling it one millimeter thick could actually cause us problems later down the line. So we want to actually add on some aspects to this just to help extend that a little bit. So what we're going to do to make sure that we give ourselves lots of extra space is we're going to go back into the sketch, go ahead and click sketch, and it's going to ask you to select a plane. Notice that it doesn't show you those planes that it first showed you this time. Uh, you can make them active if you come over to here. You can extend this list and then choose to show them. Uh, I'm not going to do that because I can just select the top face of this and then it lets me sketch on it. So that's good. Okay. So another thing to point out here is that there's this extra, I'm not sure if you saw it when that thing went around, but there is a little bit of an overlap where the actual port goes onto the chip. It's about a four millimeter overlap. So we want to actually go about four millimeters away from this edge, and then we'll draw the spacer for what would be this little microchip right here. So we do that. Go ahead and select line just to help us get a good idea of how far away we need to go. And you can see that you can actually select vertices or the center points of lines. So if you hover over it, you can see that it lets me select that. I'm going to go from here uh, simply because of the way that I'm going to construct this rectangle. And then if you drag it, as long as you're careful enough, it should automatically drag it along the next line. So we're going to go just about four out and then we can fix it when we're done. Go ahead and select that line and see we got pretty close to four. It's not exactly four, so I'm gonna change that. And now we have a four millimeter line, that's our spacing. So from here, we have a reference point to build our rectangle on. So we're not gonna use the center point rectangle this time though. We're actually gonna use a three point, or a yeah, three point corner rectangle. So we're gonna define three of the corners. Well, we know that this is one of our corners right here. We also know that it should probably, as far as trying to get the good spacing going, we should oh, we should try to have it come all the way up to the other side. So if you actually look here, you'll notice that there's a couple of these little uh, icons that popped up. That basically says that this line is actually now crossing another line at a particular point, and it's parallel to the line that it was drawn from. So this bottom surface down here, it's parallel to it, so that means it's a straight line going upwards, and that yellow part means that it has in fact intersected that line that you're talking about. So we can click there, that's our second point, and then we drag across. How did I end up with a circle? That's a great question. Not what I wanted. Okay, so we'll just repeat those steps. And then we can drag across. And again, we get the nice little icon that tells us we made it. And then rinse and repeat. All we have to do is extrude this. Let's turn it so that we can see how far it's extruding it. And if we look here, it should be 3.5 millimeters total. Excuse me, I don't know why I didn't mention on one of these, but anywho, so we know that the chip is in fact one millimeter thick, so we know that the microchips both together have to add up to 2.5 millimeters. I actually just remember this from measuring them that one of them is actually just one millimeter and the other one's 1.5 millimeter. So we're going to add both of those. So this one I'm just going to keep it as one millimeter. Go ahead and excuse me. Hold 
Oh, I, I think I know what it did. Okay. Wait, so it should go up. Okay, so it was trying to extrude down into the uh, the green plate. That's why it yelled at me. Um, so basically, the same process as last time. Go ahead and extrude that by just one millimeter. And then notice how now this is all one body. This is kind of a problem because sometimes you might want to actually have separate bodies. In this case, it's kind of okay because we want them to really be part of one thing, but if I want to color just that top part a different color, I have to actually select this feature to be able to do it. And I am going to do that because I want to make it black. So also in this drop down menu, keep in mind this body right here is all of it. If you select that body when it comes to the appearance, it's going to change the color of the entire thing. If you just want to change that new part that we made, you select the boss extrude 2. Which, by the way, you can go back and name these different extrusions if you want, because I know that the names are really awkward and hard to follow. So we want to make this one black because the actual chips look black on that circuit board. And we run into a similar... Oh, no, it actually worked. Okay, cool. So sometimes it likes to change the color of everything. It can be kind of annoying. As you can see, it didn't change the color along the sides, but that's okay. So, now we have one side of the chip done. We want to add the 1.5 millimeter side. Oops. We need to add a 1.5 millimeter part on this side. So it's also going to be, in this case, we look at the bottom part here. We want this one to actually go all the way up to the edge of the chip. Uh, so that way when we subtract it, it doesn't try to overfill where that chip would be and then you can't get it in there essentially. So luckily that's a little bit easier for us this time because all we have to do is just make another rectangle that goes the entire size. So start a sketch again. Click on the surface that we want to do it on. Yeah. Not on this side, no. Yeah, 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 but the other side, you want to leave that there. Can I what? Like this one? Can I, like, move it to a different place? Yeah, actually, so that that's going to happen a little bit later. What do you mean? Like right here? Oh. Yeah. Okay. It's actually a good thing that you pointed that out. So I'm going to show you how to fix uh, extrusions when you mess them up. So. We know that that extrusion actually came from this boss extrude. So if you have an error like this, which is probably going to happen relatively often, I got a little bit cocky and I didn't check that my dimensions were right. Thank you for telling me that. Uh, you can just come in here and it still keeps the sketch that you made. So you can just right click it and then you can edit the sketch. So in this case, now I can actually just um, fix my unfortunate mistake here. Yes. So this was supposed to be supposed to be 29. Yeah, should be 29, not 289. Great, and now it'll line up properly. So thank you for pointing that out. That would have driven me crazy later. And then it should just automatically update. So you can see now I did fix it. So. Um, yeah. Okay. So on to the other side. Um, So this one, we can do a center point rectangle because we are just going to be doing it from the center. Um, I'm going to try to be smart this time and actually, oh no, look, okay, it did give me the right dimensions, so that's great. Let me just double check this. It's not going to let me see that. Great. That is 33, and yes, that is 14.5. Okay, cool. 
So now we have the bottom part and we have to create the spacer for the microchip that's on the other side of that PCB. Um, so that other side is actually 1.5 millimeters. It doesn't show it in this diagram, but I actually remember measuring it for some strange reason. So I can tell you that that is actually indeed the size of it. So we're going to go back to features, extrude it. And then one thing to keep in mind, make sure that it's extruding in the right direction. If you flip it, it's going to yell at you because it's trying to extrude into something that's already there. And it thinks that you're trying to overlap it. It's going to freak out. Just don't do it. So make sure that it's going in the direction you want it. And we want this to be 1.5 millimeters. So now go ahead and click yay. Uh, I'm also going to change the color of this one so that I don't forget. Because I'm a fan of colors for some reason. Okay. Keep that there. Click home. And we can drag that back over. And great. So now we have our little model PCB here. Uh, we also need to add the port, the little connector port over here. So if you notice, it's not exactly the same size as the PCB. So that is something to keep in mind here. So we're going to actually try to keep it going along that line. Um, right. So we want to do another sketch. And this time we're going to do another rectangle because it's another lovely little rectangle. And we want to do a three corner rectangle. So what we know is that if you look here, there's actually a, does it show it? Uh, okay, well, it doesn't really show it on the diagrams over here. But if we look here, we see that the overall dimensions of the PCB are 14.5. Uh, the width of this little connector is only 12.9. So we need approximately, what is that? Um, one point something. Okay, yeah, so we need 0.8 space on either side. So this is kind of hard to do, but you can do it. And if you actually look here, you should be able to actually trace down and then click on it, go over, make sure it lines up, drag it down. And all we're essentially going to do here is we're going to use another dimension. So I haven't covered dimensions yet. and I'm going to show you kind of the general idea of how to work them. There's a smart dimension tool up here. There are some options with it. Uh, you have different ones. I'm just going to use smart dimensions because it generally encompasses most of the dimensions that you would use. And we want to make sure that our spacing on either side is right. So what we do here, oh, I should probably mention, make sure that the width of this line is in fact what it's supposed to be before you do this. Otherwise it won't work right. Yay. Okay. There should be a way to actually go about fixing this. Right. Oh, okay. Right. Yep, so we can just automatically adjust it. Uh, we go down to here. This is actually kind of cumbersome, so I'm just going to get rid of this rectangle and do the line method that I always like to do. So we'll start here, come up by 0.8. We're not going to really hit 0.8, but once we're done, we'll just reselect the line, resize it to be 0.8 millimeters, and then we can do the lovely little three point rectangle. Start at that vertex, go all the way over. Drag it up. Doesn't matter how far you drag it up. And then we're just going to manually change this length here. So see, we kind of got close to 12.9, but we weren't at 12.9. Okay. 
now we have the correct overlap on it. So, the other thing to notice here is that it overlaps by four millimeters, which indeed it is doing here, but it also goes out more. So in total, it's actually 18.9 millimeters. So what we can do is select this line. Instead of having it be four, we'll call it 18.9 millimeters. Okay, well usually that works. Hmm. Oh yeah, it's I, I yeah actually you're right I forgot it's because it's um coincident with this. So that's another thing to keep in mind. Uh, every time you draw things, it has a tendency to make relations with other things. So in this case, this point is coincident with that line, so that means it's on that line. So if you want it to be able to be more freeform, you have to actually get rid of it. Uh, and luckily, when we get rid of that one, it gets rid of this one too. So now we can actually change this. At least we should be able to. Yes. Cool. Uh, the other thing here is you can zoom to fit, zoom to an area if you want to. I'm going to use zoom to fit here because I want to be able to see all of it. Oh, at least I should be able to see all of it. And great. So now we have the actual dimensions. What is going on here? Weird extra line. Um, yes, so we're going to take a little bit of a shortcut. We know it basically has a certain width and it goes onto the other side. However, it doesn't actually, um, at this part right here, it doesn't overlap here. It just kind of starts up here a little bit. So what we're going to do is we're going to actually extrude this in two dimensions, or not two dimensions, but um, two directions, I should say. So it should be, let's see, uh, 4.5 millimeters total. Great. And we know that it's two millimeters from this thing right here. We can see that it's two, mil two millimeters on this part right here, which is where it's extruding down right now. So we want to make sure that that one is actually two. And then we need a second direction now because we also need it to go the other way. So we only had two going on the other way. So now we have two millimeters. And if we count it, we know that the PCB is one millimeter thick. So now we're at three millimeters. So we need an extra 1.5 millimeters going that way. Um, so we actually need 2.5 because we have to go past the PCB and then an extra 1.5. So we're going to change that to 2.5. So oh, weird. I feel like it should be. Okay, that's kind of odd. It's not supposed to do that. Edit that feature. So that one went two millimeters. That went 2.5. No, yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Great. So now we have our own little thingy here. I'm going to change the color of this so that I can make sure that I know kind of what I'm looking at. Yay. And instead of it being plastic, I'm going to make it metal. I'm going to go for aluminum and let's make it shiny because why not? Cool. Great. So now we have our own little mini version of a flash drive chip. So what we want to do Go ahead and pull this in, zoom out quite a bit. And then we want to make the shape of our actual housing. So we're going to need our planes again. So 
So we need, I'm going to use the top plane just because I like the top plane. It's, it makes it easier for me to work with. Um, and you just want to click show. So if you right click, you can hide it or you can show it. Uh, once you define something already in one sketch, it will automatically hide it, but you can reshow it if you want. And you can also resize this, which I'm going to do because I might need it a little bit wider. Great. Okay, so um, I have a lot of time, so I'm going to try to go with a relatively simple shape. Um, I'm just going to make another center point rectangle. And if we look, um, I always forget. I think it overlaps by about one or two millimeters onto the actual metal part. So, right. So we want to draw a line first. And luckily, even though this isn't part of this actual sketch that we're making, we can still use other parts of other sketches as references. So we know that the actual metal part necessarily starts right here. So we want to go about two millimeters over. Right about there. Please don't do that. Oops. And then change that to two. Great. Okay. And we're going to draw another line just for uh, curiosity's sake. And just drag it up here. I don't know why it, it looks jagged to me, but okay. Right. And then if we drag over here, we should be able to actually line up with this. Right. Aha. Yeah, we can. Okay. So now we have the actual width that we need it to go for. We also know that it needs to be at least 14.5 millimeters wide. Um, you want to leave at least one millimeter of spacing if you can. So we want to add an extra two to three because you need some on each side. So we're going to actually make it, instead of 14.5, we're going to make it more so around, why did you not make a line? Thank you. So, I'm going to make this line instead. Actually, 18.5 is not a bad idea. So, we'll make it 18.5 millimeters wide. So, that way we get a little bit of extra padding on either side. Uh, great. So, now that we have that, we also wanted to go out a little bit past this. I'm going to say go out a little bit more like two millimeters out, just so we have an extra little bit at the back. So this line will be just kind of a reference. So we'll go with our three point rectangle in this case. Um, we will, if you also, by the way, if you hover over things, it'll keep that little coincidence for you. So I can just drag it over here and I get a nice line. Bring it up. And then I want to go out a little bit more. And then I can actually change the size of that line. So at that 40 right now, um, the whole thing is about 48. So call it about 40. Because we need some actually sticking out of the edge. Um, and you can see how a lot of this is kind of just up to like your own personal choices on things. This is why prototyping is such a huge thing because it might seem like a great idea and then you do it and then it doesn't work. Um, great. So now we can get rid of some of these extra lines. Oh, don't do that. That's the line we want to get rid of just because they're kind of messy and they take up space. And get rid of that one. Great, so now that we have this, it's all selected. Come to Features, go ahead and extrude it. Yay. Okay, so we also do want to extrude it in both directions. Keep that in mind. I don't know why it's not letting me... Oh, okay, so it didn't keep in mind that selection. So if this ever happens, down in your selected contours, Go ahead and click on that, and then whenever you select something, it'll highlight it for you, and that's how you know that's what it's actually going to be using. So we want to actually do it in both directions because it needs to cover both sides of the flash drive. Uh, we know that the entire flash drive is just about 
4.5 ish millimeters thick. So we probably want to go sort of more about like 6 to 6.5. Uh, I'm going to go 6.5 for um, curiosity's sake. So we actually have to divide that in two because we're going in two directions. So we're going to have 2.25 here. And then we're going to have another direction where it's going down. That one will also be 2.25. Great. No, three points. Thank you. My math is not working today. I'm sorry. Come on. Awesome. Cool. Okay. So now we got those assigned. Go ahead and select. Uh, you can do things called fillets on this, or fillets, I don't know what they're actually pronounced as. Um, I'm going to kind of skip over that for sake of time, and I'm going to show you the other things. Um, so one of the things that you need to be able to do is you need the moving copy bodies tool. If You probably won't have this, and you probably also won't have the combined tool up here. What you do, open this little top bar, hit this down menu, go to commands, and then you can just search it. Once you have it, you just click and drag it onto your uh, toolbar. I don't need to combine anything just yet, though. So I'm going to basically move this right here. Not combine. Sorry. So when it comes to the move tool, you basically want to just click the body that you want to move. And you see you get like this lovely little thing that pops up for you. So I want to make sure that I'm looking directly down at it. And I only want to move it in the Z direction right now just to line it up. So I'm going to pull it along till it just about lines up where I want it. Maybe a little bit more that way. And I also have some constraints, but anywho. So this is not incredibly exact, and you could most definitely do this to be more exact. Uh, I'm going to kind of do it a little bit more wiggy just for time's sake. So great, now we have it lined up, right? But now we need a space inside of it, otherwise it's basically useless as a flash drive. It's also kind of weirdly overlapping in some places, but that's fine. Now we get to use another really common tool, the combine tool. This is another one that you'll have to add to it. So you can actually, you can add them together if you want to make a whole body out of two separate bodies. Um, that's not really what we want to do here, though. Uh, in this case, we want to actually subtract the bodies. So whatever is overlapping, they are going to subtract the part out. So you have to have your two bodies here. You have a main body. That's the part that's going to hold everything. And then the bodies to combine is basically the part that you're going to subtract out from that. So we know our main body in this case is this whole little outer casing. And then the bodies to combine is all of this mess inside. So we can show a little bit of a preview of what it would look like. You see how it digs out a nice little space inside. Great. So we go ahead and select. And now we have a lovely USB holder. Uh, this is kind of a problem, though, because how do you get the USB in there? Well, you need to cut it in half so that you can put them together. So another quick thing that we're going to do before I show you basically the process of how to set up 3D printing it. Reference planes. We're going to use an intersect tool. And the intersect tool basically allows you to use a plane or something like that to literally just cut through something and create different bodies from it. Uh, so we're going to draw a plane directly through the middle and then use that to cut it in half so we get two separate pieces. And then we can move those separate pieces individually. The way that we want to do that is we can make a reference plane. So we want to make a plane, and we're going to need some references to make the plane. So the first reference in this case, we're going to use the actual top plane itself. Uh, great. And you can see now where you can adjust. You can do some different things, parallel, perpendicular, so on and so forth. But the key point here, you can change your offset. So we know that it's about, mm, about 6.5 millimeters thick. So, oh, that's actually where the top plane is. Anyway, so we'll just use the top plane in this case, but yeah, so you can change this offset if you need to. This is really useful if you need to make really complex shapes from drawings. Um, right. So 
So, since I already made that extra plane, I'm going to use it, because why not? So, intersect should already be in your toolbar. If it's not, it's, it's a very simple way to do it. So, if you actually look at your selections, um, it's very pivotal that you actually get it in order. So, you see that the plane comes first. So go ahead and select your plane, then select your body. Um, now you see you can create intersecting regions. What this basically means is that if you have multiple planes, if they bound an area, it will make that area solid. Uh, we don't want to do that here. You can also create internal regions where if you have solid bodies in that plane creates a body inside of there that's actually a void, it'll make it a body. Again, we don't want to do that. So we'll just create both. Which one does which? All right, okay, so now we have two separate regions. Lovely, so if you do both, it will actually give you the space inside, which is kind of a problem. Um, but in this case, luckily, it didn't really do that for us. So now we have the two halves, yay. So all we have to do in this case, just hit select. Now we have two different bodies. In each of those bodies, we can move separately. Okay, uh, now we can move them separately to set them up for actual 3D printing. So this one, I want to move it this way. And then I need to flip it over because I don't want it to print just like that. So there should be a way to actually do this. Uh, yeah, rotate. Okay. So all you have to do. So we're looking down on the y direction. So you want to rotate it by 180 degrees in the y direction. Okay. Okay, that was weird. Edit. Move it over there. Oh, it only lets you translate or move it. Okay. Well, that's kind of weird, but all right. So we can move this one up. Anyways, the key point is to try to separate them so that we can actually get them aligned up in the way that a 3D printer would want to move them and then print them. So this one, we just want to bring it up to the plane. And luckily, this doesn't have to be super exact because when you actually put it in something like here, it'll snap it to the surface that it's going to print from. And then this one, I'm just going to rotate it because of the way that 3D printers print. It's best to not have to print with supports if you can. Great. I hope you want to work. it in Kira. So now that we got the actual just general shape of everything set up, we actually have to get it into Kira. And another thing that I would recommend if you ever want to do something like this in uh, your future, this fillet tool, these are sharp edges. 3D printers don't really like sharp edges most of the time. They'll round it for you, which is really useful. Um, I kind of wanted to do that, but I don't want to mess with it right now for the sake of time. So now that we're done, um, go ahead and save it. Now, when you go to save stuff, especially if you want to 3D print it, always go to save as, and you want to save it as a 3 uh, STL file. Um, I forgot I'm in this, so it's going to make me look for my 
one drive. Screw it. Let's get me back to it. Okay, so now I'm in my one drive. Now, let's just call it example part. Cool. I mean, it should have already saved, so we can go ahead and close this out. Um, I'm going to leave SolidWorks open in case anybody wants to ask a question about it. Great, so now we don't particularly need the PowerPoint just yet. And what I have to do is pull up... Oh, this is Cura, by the way. Uh, it's free to download. It's literally just spelled C-U-R-A. Uh, it's free. Just Google the website and you can find the download link for it. It doesn't take very long to set up. Um, so let's pull up my OneDrive real quick so I can get that file out. And example parts. So you can see here that I did not save it as the right type of file, but it should be able to import it anyways. You should just be able to. Nope, yeah, it won't. Okay, so it's a good thing I kept this open. So should this ever happen, all you have to do is just open it again. Um, don't make the same mistake that I just made and actually save it as the file type that you want. STL files are the ones that most uh, things like. So you would just choose a different file type and STL is right there. So go ahead and hit OK. It's going to make it out of these weird triangles and yell at you. Just hit yes. Awesome. Go ahead and close that now. Go back here. And now we can actually use this part. And notice how it shows it as a, a C right here. So that means it actually recognizes it as a file that it can use. So when you boot up Cura, it's pretty much going to take you to a screen like this. Um, it has an example printer in it so that you can play with settings. If you actually have a printer that you're hooking it up to, it will set it up for that. Otherwise, you just essentially make the process for it, and then you plug that process into the printer, and it just does it for you. So let's find that lovely window. And one of the great things about Cura is you can literally just drag things in And there we go. So, again with the uh, clicking the middle mouse button, also if you right click, you can change the directions of things. So, you can also click these down here. Right. So, go ahead and select that. And then another thing that you gotta do here, make sure that you select this, and now we can fiddle with them. So you can drag it, you can move it, if you move it, it should snap it back. Um, you can also rotate it, so, which is lovely. So I want it to be like this, I guess. And then I want it to lay flat. Great. And there's also other things that you can do. You can also choose settings to block supports. I don't know why you would want to do that, but it is an option. You can mess with your support settings. This right here per model settings is very important. One of the main things, you can see that there's a lot of options here and this is not all of them. If you click show all, there is so much more. The one that I want you to know the most about, or at least be acknowledging of what it is, and I gotta find it, because I always forget where it is. But it has to do with the way it holds it down to the actual plate brim. Okay. Here we go. So this brim is basically, if you go ahead and like print something like this, there will be a little like extra bit stuck on the bottom that holds it to the plate. Uh, and then that just peels up and you can just pull it off. It's really easy. Um, that brim is really important. If you don't have it, it'll wiggle sometimes. And then all of a sudden your print comes out in a really weird way and you don't want that to happen. Um, so always make sure that you adjust your brim so you can change your brim settings. So maybe in this case I want it to be like, make it obscene. Right? No? Okay. Giving me issues with it, but anyways. So, once you get all of that essentially settled out, you would want to click Slice. Slice will basically show you the slices that it's going to go through when it makes it. So you can do like a preview or you can save it to a disk. This is essentially how you tell the 3D printer to go about printing it. 
the slicing is just the method that it goes through to do it. So if you had a disk, uh, most of the time a disk in this case basically means like a, a um, like a computer card or something like that. Uh, you can also do it to a flash drive if you have a good enough flash drive. Uh, in this case, I just want to show you the preview. So it goes in, in this case, it's going to go in 48 steps. So going down to step one is the brim. It's going to print the brim first. If you notice, if you actually look from above, it's not printing the actual part yet. It's printing the brim that it's going to build the part through. And then once it finishes that, it starts actually printing the part, goes through, prints more of the part, and then it starts on the other part. For some reason, it didn't do a brim on the other side, but that's OK. So you can also monitor how things are actually printing if you have it hooked up to a particular printer. This is just like the preset one, so it's not going to actually do anything, but you can add a printer. Uh, you can save it to a disk, a um, couple of different forms for it. Again, your ST files pop up, but anyways, so that's good. You also have different options for things. You can look through the actual stuff. Yeah. But anywho, and you can also change the specifics on your actual printer here. So like your profile, you can make it print smaller, thinner print, wider print, visuals, and so on and so forth. And then your infill, this is a really important thing. If you have a solid body, so like this one is a really bad example of this because you really can't see the infill, but I did try to bring it for that reason. These have wall thicknesses to them. They don't, unless you specify it to do so, it's not going to print it as one whole sheet. It's going to print like an outside layer and then some pattern inside to fill up the inside and keep it structurally sound. That way you cut down on cost. You can tell it's print the whole way through, or you can have it do a percent infill is what it's called. You just determine like how much percentage of that volume is just an infill pattern. What kind of infill pattern do you want? Um, there should be an option here, but you can do lots of different types of infills. They have like just regular line ones. You can do a hexagonal shaped ones. There's lots of options for it. Um, great. So that's essentially that. So. So it works here. That being said, questions. There's also my